Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We commemorate St. Irenaeus, and also we commemorate this within the act of St. John the Baptist. We will commemorate them in Mass, the preface of the Blessed Trinity. Mass scheduled, mass scheduled for, for July. There's the second and fourth Sunday in July. It'll be at this time, the usual time, 1 p.m. I brought some flyers down for a retreat back to New York. They should be back to the vestibule. If you're interested, their information will be back there. Also, I want to thank everyone for their prayers when I was convalescing. Uh, I had my appendix removed. I think it was your prayers that facilitated me leaving. I went in the hospital Saturday night. I was out Sunday night. So, uh, and I was up and I wasn't up and running fast, but I was up and moving on Monday. And then uh, I just keep getting better. So I do want to thank you for all your prayers. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. For the expectation of the creature waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject in hope. Because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain even till now, and not only it, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gospel appointed for today's Mass, take the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. At that time, when the multitude pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets, and going up into one of the ships that was Simon's, he desired him to draw back a little from the land, and sitting, he taught the multitudes out of the ship. When Now when he had ceased to speak, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and set down your nets. For a draught, and Simon answering said to him, Master, we have labored all the day and have taken nothing, all the night and have taken nothing, but at thy word I'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a very great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned to their partners and were, that were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filling both ships so that they were almost sinking. Which when Simon Peter saw, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was wholly astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. And Jesus saith to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And having brought their ships to land, leaving all things, they followed him. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have labored all the night and have taken nothing, but thy word I will put, I will let down the net. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Just to put this in perspective, historically, I guess, timeline, our Lord was, just came, he just came down from Jerusalem. We know this from scriptures, those who have compiled the sequence of events of our Lord's life. He came back, came down from Jerusalem, uh, St. Peter, St. John, St. James, they, in our Lord's absence, went back to fishing to, I suppose, make ends meet, to make, have to make a living. And our late Lord came back to Capernaum, which is referred to, I think, by St. Luke in, in Scripture, as our Lord's city. It was his, his favorite city. It's referred to as his city, Capernaum. And there he went out to the lake of Genezareth. People hearing that he was in the vicinity came there and began listening to him speak. He went out on the boat of St. Peter's and he began preaching sitting there. And when he finished, Saint, he told St. Peter to let down his nets for a draught of fish. St. Peter, if you just, just imagine St. Peter laboring all the night, catching nothing, knowing that there was nothing there, almost, not as a rebuke, but almost as a complaint that we've worked all the night and caught nothing. But knowing our Lord, our Lord said, do it. He was going to do it. And he was wholly astonished. Hence his response, depart from me as sinful man. I would venture to say, I, maybe I'm thinking for myself, that in that circumstance, I'd say it's a waste of time doing that because 
I already did it. That is the position many of us are in. We rely upon our own resources, our own abilities, and we find that we come up short. And we wonder, why is we're doing that? And when the command is there that we should let down the nets, or whatever the command is for, inspiration, or the commands we're supposed to do this or that, we almost, not with resentment, but with reluctance, we, I'll use the comparison, we let down the nets finally. And we only need, with very little experience, to find out how much we need to rely upon Almighty God, we rely upon our Lord himself. We don't need to just look at our own life. Our own life, sometimes we can say, well, I need to do something about that. I need to do something to take care of my own spiritual life. And usually what it is that we start relying on our own abilities, our own ingenuity, our own capabilities, and we, like St. Peter, come up short. We have to turn to prayer. Prayer has to become a part of our life, a resignation to God's will, of course, always. But a prayer has to become a real part of our life. For those who don't think they need our Lord, who maybe, maybe they, people question, uh, is there a God? Or maybe they say, well, there's a God, but what difference does it make? It leads to all kinds, and who knows what thoughts go through people's minds in this day and age. And if we, we look at society in general, we look around us, and there we see a, a society that's, I'll use the word, is, is in disaster. In this present day, this present age, uh, we see people turning away from the faith, people attacking the faith, people trying to destroy society, and we almost, with a certain, not a fear maybe, a certain uh, wonderment, like what can we do, and we're trying to prepare for the worst, and we don't give the very first line of defense any effort. Just remember, when, when, when Pope Pius V, when the Saracens, Saracens, the Saracens would go by various names. We referred to as Muslims now, they're oftentimes referred to as Turks, uh, Islam, Islam, Islams, uh, uh, a number of terms. But it was when Pope Pius V was repelling Islamism, uh, the Turks, the Muslims, they were encroaching upon in Spain, when it, it, coming into Spain, they were coming across the Mediterranean into the Holy Land. Pope Pius V gathered the, the Christian, the Catholic kings together. He built up, a, got his army together, went out to fight them, a navy to fight them in Lepanto. But the very first thing he did, he turned to prayer. He invoked the people to pray, to pray the rosary, that these Muslims might be turned back, that they might be repelled from invading Europe with all the, the pestilence, if you will, that come, came behind them. But I think nowadays, in this present age, people have forgotten that our first line of defense is prayer. The very first line of defense is prayer. And I think, and let me just read a quotation. Uh, at the present age, it's especially imperative that Catholics are well grounded in the teachings of their religion, because on the one hand, the truths of our faith are now bitterly attacked, and on the other hand, there's often lamentable ignorance on the part of the faith which leads to a carelessness in practice and many times a total loss of faith. Boy, how appropriate it is for this time that someone would see that and write it for this time. That was written in 1922. 1922. And some writers saw the evils taking place then, uh, where the faith is being bitterly attacked. He could have been writing today. Not just tearing down the monuments, but just trying to destroy anything that is Catholic. Any, all the, 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 the windows, the statues, whatever it might be, stained glass windows, all that is Catholic that would turn us and remind us and turn us back to Almighty God is being attacked today. And we must remember our first line of defense is prayer. It has to be prayer. If we rely upon our own, own, rely, rely on our own uh, ingenuity, we're like St. Peter, Almost, I won't say without hope, but certainly without any uh, expression of, of uh, enthusiasm, thinking that, well, not much can be done. Or the very thought, well, why do I have to do this? Why am I going to do this? Because it, it will, I'll profit nothing. I'll reap nothing. I'll bring nothing out. And yet, our Lord made it very clear that when he is, I'll use the word, involved, 
when he is there, when he looks after his own, uh, the nets will be breaking. They'll be overflowing, such that not only breaking, but filling two ships to the point of sinking. And if we see that take place, we see what took happen at the Battle of Lepanto, how the, the, the Turks were so badly beaten with an inadequate navy that the, that, the, that, the, that the Pope had at that point in time. And we can go through and look at all the other examples, the various heresies, for example, St. Dominic was preaching the, the, the Roji, the, spreading the devotion to the Roji, how it repelled the heresy at that point in time. And if we wish to repel it, it's just not a political evils we're facing in this day and age. The political realm is just an out, an out uh, cropping, if you will, of the lack of the spiritual life. So if we want to correct the, the political world, then we have to pr correct the spiritual world. Because once again, that's just a, a consequence of a poor spiritual life. And if in 1922, or maybe I should say in 2020, at this present age, it's imperative that Catholics be well grounded in the teachings of, the, of, our, of their religion. Because on the one hand, the truths of the faith are now being bitterly attacked, and it's on the other hand, as if I'm talking now in 2020, which I am. On the other hand, a lamentable ignorance on the part of the Catholics concerning our faith. And we can look back at that ignorance and that, that falling away, uh, those who weren't grounded in the faith in 1922. Maybe it's because of what they did then, we have the, 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 we're reaping the, the fruits of what they did then now. And if we don't do something now, what kind of fruits are we going to be reaping 80 years from now or 100 years from now, 100, uh, 98 years from now? What will they be reaping then if we do nothing now? If we don't know our faith now, if we're not well-founded in the faith, what are we going to be doing now? We're going to see the falling away from the faith. We're going to be, see attacks upon religion. And there will be no help. Prayer, aside from knowing our faith and living our faith, practicing our faith, being uh, well-founded in our faith, prayer is certainly going to be the means that we must turn to to repel the enemy. Something that the, the, we read in the breviary, the priests read the breviary every day at Compline. It's a quote from St. Peter. The church wants priests to be continu continually to be reminded uh, that the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the Democrats, the Republicans, and the, whoever it might be out there, the politicians. And it's very, it's again, uh, St. Peter says, it's, he said the devil, he said the devil. It goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. That's what we're fighting. It's a spiritual battle. And if we, in spite of fighting a spiritual battle, it has to be spiritual weapons. And the forefront of those weapons is prayer itself. And we only need to turn to the Old Testament. And countless examples where our Lord made it absolutely clear that it's he who is fighting this battle. I forget the exact circumstance. I'll just mention one circumstance in the Old Testament. I think, I, I, I want to say Judas Maccabee was going to the battle, and so our Lord says, too many soldiers, too many, you got too many soldiers. I want to pare them down, so he says, well, I want to take only those who are, I'll use, right-handed. And then he says, still too many. He told whoever it was, Maccabee, it's Jewish Maccabee, whoever, that I want them to see how they drink the water. If they're going to scoop their hand up or they drink out of the water. So separate them down. Finally, it got pared down to such a small number that there's no way in the world that they would win this battle against the, the pagans and then our Lord commanded them to go into war. And he wanted to do that in order for them to understand that it's not them fighting this battle, it's not them winning this war, it's God himself intervening and running this war. And how many other examples we can pull from Scripture that this is indeed the case? And because we are in a battle, and the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour, then we have to remember that we have to turn to prayer and prayer will be that safe haven, will be that defense, it will be the means by which we repel the enemy, that roaring lion. And so if we have not been insistent in prayer, if we have not been saying our prayers with devotion, then now is the call, is the call where we must turn to prayer and resist the enemy because our faith is now being bitterly attacked in general across the country and specifically against you and I individually. The devil isn't concerned with society in general. That doesn't have a soul in itself. He wants the individual. The individual souls make up society, but he's going to attack the individual soul. 
And we must have that strong safeguard. We must have that protection. We must have our shield. We must have on a helmet, if you, as St. Paul would say. We must have on the, the sword, the shield, all the, those means which we can repel the enemy. And the first of those, the first of those is prayer. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.